you describe your job here a little bit to me? Well, um, I, I run the drama, all the drama work the BBC does uh, in television. And uh, I'm called head of drama group. The group comes in because there are three departments. And uh, one department does the serials, one department does series, one department does single plays. Uh, the latter department also does opera. And uh, this is in my care. Uh, in terms of size, we do about um, 666 separate shows a year. Um, this is done by a staff of um, producers, directors, no designers. They're not part of my people. And there's uh, uh, subsidiary staffs uh, totaling about 325 people. Uh, the amount of money which uh, is involved in this operation is in excess of 19, 20 million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Six over 600 original. Plans. No, they're not all originals, no. but I would say that uh, a good. Uh, 90%, 95% will all be specially written for television. Uh, the range, of course, is terrific because, uh, uh, for example, uh, here on the, the Forsyth Saga, this will consist of uh, uh, 26 50-minute episodes. Well, all those, of course, have been um, dramatized from the original Galsworthy novels. Mm -hmm. Um, at the other end, we've got uh, a silly program like uh, Doctor Who, uh, which is a fictional uh, sci-fi kind of thing for family viewing late on Saturday afternoon. Well, this is all specially written. It's a half hour. This thing comes from it. Mm -hmm. And um, we have uh, uh, a belt of programs which go on the air at 8 o'clock, like Softly Softly, which deals with police work, but done in a kind of gritty, realistic way, uh, quite truthful and very, very popular. Uh, we also do opera. Uh, we've just done a terrific production of uh, Benjamin Britten's Billy Budd. Very lucky to have him with us, in fact. You're uh, the head of that department. Uh, yes, I, oddly enough, uh, the powers that be um, were persuaded by myself that even though we may be ignorant musically, we could get good musical people to work with us, but the fact is that uh, uh, opera singers have to act, and usually the most atrocious part of any opera is the, is the acting. And I'm happy to say that um, the yeah. operas that we have done, and we do about eight a year, uh, are usually, they're beautifully performed, and of course they have all the gloss uh, and polish uh, that can be produced by very fine uh, drama directors. It sounds like you're doing a job of like three or four people. Um, you think it's better not to have so many people maybe involved? Well, uh, the fact is, uh, it's a very good comment you make. Uh, the fact is, I don't do the job that can better be done by three or four people because, in fact, I only really deal directly with about four or five people within my department. Each department, uh, within my group, each department contains, has its own head, his own tiny organizational staff, and then spreading out below him is the producer-director system. So that each program, in fact, the, the big problem in an organization of this size is to eliminate the organization. Yes, that's true. And um, so that each program, run of programs, is really produced in a small uh, microcosm consisting of a producer his story editor or editors or his literary assistant, whatever you want to call it, and his organizer, uh, well, no, no organizer at that level, and his directors. And this small little group, usually of between six and eight people, all these people are solely concerned with one project. They may do 39 programs, but, and uh, I meet with the producers only once of every four weeks. But, of course, the departmental head meets with his producers on a weekly basis. Do you have any trouble getting um, original work? Like in the States, they're always complaining there aren't any plays and all this sort of thing. I think a lot of that, uh, the reason they say that is they're looking for plays that will make money. They're not really looking for plays. Do you find it difficult to get material? Uh, well, um, no, we don't. Uh, or let's put it this way. You always have trouble getting material. Mm -hmm. You always have trouble getting 
material which you think is really fine yeah. enough. But the fact is that, uh, I mean, I remember when television started, they said, my God, will we get the actors from, will we get the yes, writers yes. and all this nonsense. The fact is, they exist. What doesn't exist is the opportunity. And television did provide the opportunity. And in this country, writers, actors, they just crawled out from under the rocks oh, everywhere. Yeah. And I think it's true anywhere. The, the opportunity does exist. On the American side, making money, well, we're interested in making money, too. We equate it differently. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we make programs for people. Um, we don't plan our programs on a cost per thousand basis. I mean, Billy Budd, uh, we're going to be spending I mean, over $100,000 on it. We have spent it. We probably will get an audience of perhaps only three, four, if we're lucky, five million people. Uh, we do in other kinds of programs where we only spend perhaps, what, um, $20,000, uh, and we may get mm -hmm. 10, 12 million people. You think you could do that any place but England, Sydney? Yes, I think you can do it uh, virtually anywhere, providing um, you have a a healthy enough sized population. Uh, Even in competition with uh, stuff like Beverly Hillbillies and uh, that sort of thing? Well, I don't really, yes. Well, I don't think these things are really in competition. Mm -hmm. It's a question of uh, the, these things sit side by side, really, rather than in competition, because the ordinary Joe, um, and I include myself in that, we want all things. I want to laugh the Beverly Hillbillies, and I want to think, and I want to be made to cry, and I want to be made to laugh. And all these things comes from the total diet of television fare, if the television fare is properly balanced. Do you prefer working uh, for the BBC or some corporation like this rather than a commercial television? Okay. Well, there are different kinds of commercial television organizations. I certainly think that... Uh, I know I was terribly happy with uh, the commercial company I was with in England, ABC Television. How commercial uh, is that compared to the American setups? Well, it's exactly as commercial in the sense that uh, they operate on a profit and loss motive, and I wouldn't say that they were any uh, less uh, anxious to make a mint of money, and certainly they were as efficient. The difference, of course, is on the who owns the programs. And the Independent Television Authority in England, uh, or rather the government instructed the Independent Television Authority that the programs must always be owned by the broadcasting organization. So the commercial television here uh, is without sponsoritis. That is, uh, a sponsor, uh, let's call him an advertiser, not a sponsor, an advertiser simply buys places, a commercial ad on the air, and according to the amount of money he spends, uh, that program is aired, uh, that commercial is aired between, say, 8 and 10.30, mm -hmm. which is roughly speaking peak time, but he doesn't know whether his program is going to go before uh, so. a, a mass audience popular program or sometimes an opera. That's good. Except good. that, well, that's why, of course, commercial television in England doesn't do as many um, programs like opera, which are minority audience mm -hmm. stuff. But uh, in my years uh, at ABC in commercial television here, I never felt even vaguely the pressures of sponsorship and his mm -hmm. sensitivities. Uh, I always felt the pressure that I had to deliver a big audience because that was the basis by which the company was solvent. Well, you sort of feel that way in television anyway, don't you? You want to reach people to a certain degree. You, of course, because it's A, it's, it's, a, it's a natural uh, mass medium. But uh, we in the BBC, of course, think of the audience as consisting of um, smaller groups. But the groups, of course, merge. I mean, when you do a sporting program, it doesn't mean that only lunkheads watch sports. I mean, the fact yes. is, an intellectual mm -hmm. can be just as captivated by a sports program. Mm -hmm. You were mentioning Pinter and social, re not social realism, but the kitchen sink school and that sort of mm -hmm. thing, and how it went over here in the 50s, the early 60s. Uh, isn't that sort of like old hat to what, say, in America, that was popular like about 30 years ago in the art world? Do you think that would have 
worked in America, the same kind of thing? Well, it's only old hat. Uh, um, it isn't old hat in any... I mean, the fact is that the human drama, uh, the relationships between... Uh, whether you're talking about a, a, a priest and a, or a, a minister and a worshiper or a boss and an employee or a child and a father. I mean, these are the sort of eternal um, elements that are inherent in all drama. The terms by which you express it can uh, change stylistically somewhat. But there's really nothing old hat. I mean, these, these plays are, are, were about, we try to do these plays about the turning points in a country. What are the points of change? And England, of course, is a terribly dramatic country since the war. Uh, because it, in the growing realization of England's sort of new and changed and reduced status in the world, uh, it's affected the, the population in, in, in a dozens of ways. And all this stuff um, is, is the stuff of drama. And if you get people to get inspired, the writers to be inspired by it. And this is what we do. Uh, there's nothing old-fashioned about it. It's gone on since the days of Euripides, you know. But it's old-fashioned in the States. Like, the battles have been won that way in the States, wouldn't you say? Well, the battle was lost in the States because of the sponsorship situation. Mm. There were too many areas that couldn't, in fact, be touched. You certainly, uh, the, the one area that the Americans explored very deeply was the personal psychological problem. They were able to explore this because it didn't touch on any institutions. Because if you touch on institutions, it's bad business for the sponsor. And so that's why I think they kill drama in the States. Mm -hmm. We have not had this restriction in England, and it's burgeoned and grown. Well, you know, as an, uh, coming in from the outside, coming back to Canada, it seems to me there are certain uh, uh, levels of authority there that are putting their foot down, and there isn't so much freedom there either, right within well, the broadcasting never... corporation, I mean. Uh, there in the United States? No, in Canada. Do you, have, do you feel that that's right, that um, the well, executives of the corporation should control the creative people and hold them down? And, fire them and all that sort of thing? Well, um, I don't know exactly what uh, the, C the CBC brass are doing. Uh, the fact is that in any organization there has to be leadership and there has to be people who are burgeoning out and, and, and whose enthusiasms and creative abilities are, are at an exciting stage of flowering. Well, how can that and be if you've got some man sitting up in an office somewhere worrying about whether you're offending somebody? much the same as the sponsors do in the States. Well, that's very bad if, if you're describing the case the way it is. Uh, I don't know who's in charge. Um, you have a rough idea. Uh, but yes, anyway. Yes, I do have a rough idea. And, uh, well, it, it's, it's obvious, and I've read this by many Canadian commentators, there should be more people who have grown up um, into the administrative levels who've come up through the actual creative process itself. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. let's face it, creative people are the most difficult citizens of any community. It's part of their role to be um, because they're iconoclastic, the in a sense. It's part of their role in society to, to prick our consciences as ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And I think that in recognizing what a healthy community is compounded, we have to support these nutty kooks who lead... You don't think of them as nutty kooks. Well... They're, as citizens, they are untidy people. In what way untidy? Uh, <laughs> you don't mean long hair and dirty necks and all that sort of thing? Superficially, this is offensive to many people. And uh, uh, this is a hard pill for ordinary people who are leading um, what they regard as simpler lives, to see these people walking around dirty with dirty fingernails and so on. People who seem to be knocking all the basic But all writers aren't like that, are they? No, but uh, it was you who raised the, 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 uh, the dirt part. The fact is, it's the artist's role in society to reveal the human condition. Yeah. And in doing that, he's bound to stick his neck out. Uh, so what do you do when he does? Well, you then, I mean, in my position, I've got to somehow argue with these people, make sure that, what, that their uh, mode of expression doesn't go beyond uh, public, what is commonly regarded as public sensibilities. 
we are a public medium and there's a lot of responsibility involved here. The trick is to do that while not damming up the creative energy. It's yeah. a question of channeling it. It isn't a question of being silver-tongued or hypocritical. The fact is there is a large responsibility in public broadcasting. Well, do you have and artists um, uh, are willing to, to be responsible, but I think have to be handled in a rather special way. And unless this is done, they're not going to create, they're going to flee the country. And this, somehow or other, this perhaps is what has happened in Canada. Well, do you have anybody that you have to kowtow to this way? Or are you sort of a free, do you have a nice free hand? And you mean kowtow to anyone above? Yes. Or kowtow to no, creative above, people below? above. No, no. And don't think there should be anybody like that. But I am that somebody. There's nobody you else. You see? Yes, well, I understand, I, but then I follow certain broad principles of public broadcasting, which uh, are universal throughout the world, and perhaps a little more specific with the BBC, because we've been in public broadcasting longer than any other organization in the world, mm -hmm. um, publicly owned public broadcasting. But um, uh, I evolve a policy which is generally in line with uh, the policy of the BBC, it is my job to make sure that my 325 people operate within that. Well, now, I people who do certain kinds of shows are enjoy more liberties than people who yeah, do other kinds yeah. of shows. Uh, well, then I think, then I, I feel then that some of the people in the higher positions and head of departments should have more uh, a closeness then with creative people, more understanding than, than exists in Canada today. Well, That's that may be. It's certainly true that they. There's got to be that sympathy and that sense of understanding of the kind of personal hell that an artist goes through. And also an interest, too. I use the word artist in the mm -hmm. broad, general sense. You think you could go back to Canada? Would you be interested in going back to work there? Yes. I am eternally interested in going back to Canada. Why? It's my country. I mean, uh, just the sheer thought of uh, uh, young and college streets and shivers of... I am dying. This you need a it rest. is true. It is true. <laughs> well, I've been away eight and a half years. You mm -hmm. see. That's a uh, I can't wait to see the Toronto City Hall. I can't wait to go to George and Pay. It's my country, and this is something deep about this. And um, it's corny, and it's Junior K Chamber of Commerce stuff. But it's me. And you think that you could do there what you've done here? You had the opportunity. I don't know. Uh, I, I would certainly... It can be done. Uh, it all depends on the conditions, the kind of freedom one has, the kind of... the tools of one's responsibility. Do you feel as free in Canada when you're there working? I don't feel I never free. felt hemmed in in Canada. Never. I don't know whether I... I, I mean, I, I got along so well with the, the General Motors people. We had terrible rows. But basically, I found that good sense generally prevailed. I didn't find... I, n I never felt profound discontents along those lines. When I worked at the film board, we had restrictions, but I l worked within them. It never debarred me from being creative. What were TV conditions like in Canada when you left? Um, well, it, uh, they were terrific, really. Uh, when it began in 52, uh, they had gathered together this sort of group of, what, about 20 of us who'd come from everywhere, from radio, from, well, I was from the film board. Uh, and uh, we, none of us knew a hell of a lot about it, although I had spent a year with NBC in New York. And uh, it was terribly exciting. Nobody had any yardsticks of judgment. Therefore, almost anything could go. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was enormous excitement engendered in which we fed off one another's enthusiasm and the thing built up and we pioneered in every sort of which way and it was terribly exciting and very tolerant times. Um, when I took over drama, and I think you may know that I started doing uh, remotes. I did sports, I did the first Grey Cup game and first boxing, ice hockey, the lot. Um, I also did some feature programs with the University of Toronto and places like that. Uh, then when I got into drama, 
I inherited a pretty good nucleus that was Silvio Narazzano and David Green and Henry Kaplan, two or three people like that, a very good nucleus. And um, uh, we worked, and uh, by the time I left in 1958, we were doing um, a steady weekly diet, I think of uh, two half-hour dramas a week plus a one-hour drama series a week, the latter sponsored by General Motors. And the half hours were, I think, sponsored by Procter and Gamble, as I recall, and I forget the other. And we had a group of about nine directors. Uh, I was the producer of all the shows, uh, as well as being the supervisor of drama. And we had a good thing. I had uh, a marvelous team. I had Nathan Cohn as one of the story editors, George Salverson as a story editor. And we all were, were excited and dedicated by getting original writing. Mm -hmm. And um, the directors were still flexing their muscles. Some of the work was extremely good. What do you think has happened along the way? Doesn't seem like that now. Well, I don't really know what is happening now. I, I am told that uh, other than Ronnie Wayman's serial, uh, that really there's very little original writing being done at all. In fact, I understand there's very little drama. And um, I think it's tragic. It, uh, drama provides a, a sense uh, of oneself for the audience that is easy to take, can be exciting. And uh, a country of Canada's size now not to have a really big and exciting uh, drama, I think it's a tremendous loss to the in a sense, the consciousness of the nation. I mean, one always complains about Canada that from Canadians, we don't know who we are, where we're going, or how we connect up with the USA. Well, I would say the bloody simple way to find out is to let the writers talk about themselves in through the form of plays, and Canadians will quickly find out what they are. Mm -hmm. And um, if there isn't much drama in Canada, I think it's a tragedy for the country as a whole. Now, if things were swinging like this, why did you leave? Well, I left for purely personal and selfish reasons. Uh, and I don't say that in any self-critical way, either. I think that we, each of us, have to find and bring out the best uh, in ourselves to mm -hmm. extend oneself. Uh, I had given it a drama there a good run. I was offered a job in a country I had heard a great deal about, England, as we all had as children. Mm -hmm. And it was a chance to give my three children a taste of a different country, mm -hmm. different tradition, different cultural climate. It was an interesting job off me. In fact, it was exactly the same as the job I had in Toronto. Did you have any particular goals in mind, like when you, st you started out to be an artist, didn't you? Yes, I did. Uh, yes, I've always had goals, yeah. um, uh, but I've always tried to sort of be aware of myself at that particular time to extend myself. I, I mean, when I was 10 years old, I wanted to be a cartoonist. Yes. And when I was 13, 14, I wanted to be a painter. And when I was 19, I was a painter. And when I was 21, I didn't think I was a good enough painter. I'd become interested in film, and luckily, uh, history intervened. The National Film Board uh, came into existence. I grabbed the opportunity, got a job. Uh, in fact, I was a very successful commercial artist, in fact, at that time. I was earning some weeks as much as a hundred bucks a week, and I gave it all up to earn one hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. at the film board. It didn't matter. Money was unimportant. And I became a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And in my ten and a half years at the film board, I guess I was associated with about 350 films, ranging... I started as a splicer boy, because I had to learn how to handle the stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote the films, many of them. I eventually became a producer, then an executive producer, and then I got interested in the educational aspects of filmmaking, the informational aspects, and therefore became fascinated by television. Because television is a highly efficient way of getting uh, ideas and attitudes and content across to millions of people so easily. 
And uh, the film board sent me down to New York, uh, and I worked with NBC for a year as an observer, sent back reports every month on various phases of television. I spent four months in drama there, spent four months on remotes, uh, in the news department and so on, and it was um, a report that I'd written on remotes that made the CBC offer me a job to do remotes mm -hmm. for them. Aside from the fact that you wanted to come here just because of the change of scene and climate and everything, did you feel that, though, that you sort of reached the end, uh, you couldn't really go on much further in Canada? Did you, did you get that feeling about Canada? There wasn't much else you could do there. Did you feel tied down? Or? Uh, it's, a, it's a tricky question to answer. Uh, uh, well, I did myself. Just, did you? I felt that way. That's why I left. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 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 it's the sort of thing I, I really hate to admit, but I guess perhaps it is true, uh, uh, when one, the fact is, I was really perhaps not tired of, of Canada or anything like that. I think I became tired of being a producer in television. Yeah. You understand I'm using the word producer, not as a director. What's the difference? Profound difference. A director stages the actors before the camera. The director mm -hmm. interpret. Mm -hmm. It's a ter question of terminology. In Canada, you'd call him a producer. That's why I ask you. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, the term producer, in, in my sense, in Canada would now, I suppose, be a supervising it's producer. In America, they call it a producer. Yes, yes. yes. Um, and I really, I think, was fed up with being a mm. supervising producer of programs. Uh, the, so the, the, I was faced with two choices. One was to eventually get out of television. But when the opportunity came to work in television in another country, I thought, well, this might be open for cakes. Did you the fact is, I'm obviously a very unstable guy. Anyone who starts out as a painter as long as and then the becomes a filmmaker yeah. and then gets into sort of documentary-type uh, television ones and then ends up by being a drama chief, mm -hmm. uh, there must be something very restless about me. As long in as fact, I really want to play the flute someday. <laughs> when you came to England, Sydney, what were the challenges that faced you? Well, there were really two challenges, personal and professional. The personal challenge was to, because I've always believed that uh, any art I was interested in had to have a connection with the people, with the audiences. Obviously, I was at a terrific disadvantage. I didn't know much about England, except what I'd learned at school or seen in the movies. So um, I set about, I made as many trips inside the country as I could, and I went up to Scotland, and I spent weeks up there, and I went to Wales and the Cornwall and to Ireland and so on to get the feel of the place. Professionally, I didn't really like what I saw here on television. And uh, it seemed to me the problems were very simple. Most television drama in 1958, and I would say most, I mean 98% of it, consisted of either dramatizations of short stories or novels, or consisted of um, hand-me-down theater plays, mm -hmm. which were adapted for television. And um, in going into the kind of history of the theater, the theater has always been a kind of middle-class activity in the main. It's existed in the West End, uh, and one always saw um, drawing room comedies and uh, anyone for tennis uh, type situations. These plays never had any real roots in, in the mass of the audience. I had come here uh, two years or so after John Osborne had written Look Back in Anger, uh, which in my books was a terrific play and that it expressed the sort of discontents of a burgeoning sort of working class, mm -hmm. feeling its intellectual and social oats. And I sent about to get and I, I determined that I was going to get plays specially written for television. So that was essentially a craft, creative problem. Uh, because this, you know, dialogue for the theater is usually too loud, and it's written to be belted out, and uh, the acting is usually insincere. Yeah. Not that the audience in the theater would find it so, but put that kind of acting on camera, and immediately too it's much. too big. So I set about to make certain that, A, all the plays I would use would have their origins in television. That is, it would have a desire to express what it had to say within terms that were best for television. 
Secondly, because I always believed in the writer being in quite close to the production, uh, uh, this was an it, it automatically meant that my writers were English. Uh, at first, I was able to get a hold of virtually dozens of writers who couldn't sell their plays in the West End. They were no names, uh, and it was foolish for me to try to buy Terence Rattigan or top writers like that. They wouldn't write for television. They because, wouldn't? Not in those days, no. The money wasn't big enough. Oh. And uh, the opportunity, f and it was an alien medium. It was, you know, a bit similar to the way it was in Canada. A lot, of, snobbish the, about a lot of the top radio writers wouldn't um, sort of get down their hands and knees and look at television from the television director's point of view. Mm. And, um, well, then there was a byproduct of having writers and cast-off writers from the West End and new writers where they were locals. They were ordinary people. Uh, so therefore, they wrote about the country that they knew of the, around their own times. And we discovered that the audiences were just eating the stuff up. And in retrospect, looking back, the audience loved the plays because the plays were about them, yes. not about some elegant they people can. in drawing rooms. And hence was born uh, what uh, was given the sort of vilified term, kitchen sink drama. Yeah. These plays weren't sordid or sexy or dirty or <laughs> filled with dirt, doubt, and disbelief, which is the phrase. They were plays really about the working class. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in England, the working class was being presented not as comic foils. Mm -hmm. And um, this paid off. It paid off in enormous amounts of profits for my employers at ABC Television. But it somehow fitted in with the... Uh, commercial television operation of selling items worth threepence and three shillings, cheap little common items that were bought like soap, mm -hmm. bought by millions. And here were plays that somehow expressed something to them, and so they flocked to commercial television. Uh, the BBC, uh, up to that uh, point, had been kind of in a sort of solid, square, and frightfully sincere way, were doing a grand job but had leaped ahead of the common man. Yes. I mean, it is almost still true to say that when England is in a crisis or... I mean, the BBC gets fabulous audiences when on a Churchill's funeral or a World Cup game or mm -hmm. something of major national importance. Uh, that holds still true today, but in those days, England, w uh, the BBC was only regarding that light, and this was the tremendous advantage that commercial television somehow cottoned on to. And in the field of drama, I, I eventually ended up by having the best drama series in the country, and this came about because I found new writers. And Harold this Pi armchair theory. This is armchair theater. Armchair. In, yes, called armchair theater. And um, uh, I found and, and presented the first plays on television of uh, Alan Owen and uh, Harold Pinter. Really? And um, virtually dozens of very respectable playwrights got their first opportunities in that series. Hmm. And then at the same time, um, the directors I had, um, some of them Canadian, Ted Kotcher for one, uh, became famous. We all did, in fact. It was a very interesting thing. All of us connected with that show have one way or another uh, found ourselves well, top people in drama. And uh, this was done um, by doing a job for the country in, in a curious and interesting way. Mm -hmm. It was this series that um, made the director general instruct Kenneth Adam to try and get Sidney Newman. Because what I had done, while my plays were highly entertaining, were gripping. The fact is, they did have a very serious content. Mm -hmm. They were about the times. They were about live issues. They were what people somehow subconsciously needed and wanted. Would it be as easy to do that right now if you moved, if you were just dropped in here in 1966? No, no. no it's uh, extremely it's difficult now for someone to make a mark in quite the same way. But I mean. Uh, 
you, are you still interested in sort of identifying with the working class with your plays? Are you caught up in that now at all? Yes, it's... it's are you well, going to develop uh, beyond uh, that? The working class has a, a kind of... Um, uh, social class conscious connotation. The fact is I am interested in, I do identify with a majority of people who happen to be working class, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I think our art is a public art. And we reach out to many publics. And sometimes in some subjects, the publics join together and that we call a mass public. And sometimes they don't. But no matter how good a thing is, you can't keep on with the same thing year after year, like the idea of uh, having the angry young men, the John Osborns and that, that were like hot in 1958, or had their timing was right or something, and your timing was right. Yes. Um, how long is that going to go on? Are you going to move on to different kinds of plays? Well, you know what it's like as an artist. You don't go on. You just find Develop, yourself grow. developing and growing. And uh, the language of television drama is uh, are many now. It'll I mean, be more sophisticated now. Well, there are various kinds. I mean, there's a lot of drama which still goes out, which is very satisfying to a public, which, in fact, has not progressed in terms of its form mm -hmm. and the way it tells a story, much, say, beyond 1956. Mm -hmm. There are other kinds of drama which are rather complex, rather challenging. I'm talking about Beckett and mm -hmm. some of Pinter's stuff. Very difficult to mm -hmm. get. The art there, the genius there, is to make it so lucidly clear because usually most good writers no matter how complex the surface may appear there's something organically sound and simple inside and one's job is to try to get that simplicity to cut through all the surface difficulties of course a lot of phony devices you the more complex a play the more important it is to have a highly attractive actor play it mm -hmm. Uh, what should be done, do you think, to build a healthy uh, Canadian television drama scene? Well, firstly, I, I would suggest that the, um, the will has to exist at the top level in the CBC, that it wants drama. Uh, and if it uh, does, then I would suggest that uh, Toronto could support Toronto uh, because I know the conditions there best, could one large center could support about an hour and a half drama a week. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest uh, a one-hour weekly series to the, uh, of single plays to the extent of about 39 a year. And I would suggest a weekly half-hour series of separate plays. I think series and serials are different kinds of breeds. That requires certain professionalism and uh, so you need an hour and a half's drama a week in the form of two programs, and I would put a man in charge of each. I would uh, ask him to go out to all the sources where he might get writers, that is, I'd go to the universities, the writing courses, the, the, the literary clubs. I would go to the journalists. Who, I would go to anybody who, who is writing. Mm -hmm. And in that group, to try to get them to visualize things in terms which d demonstrate conflict. Uh, one would need money to support it. I don't think it would require that really that much money. And above all, I think the inspiration ought to be the writer's own environment. And perhaps what's even more important is to get it out of one's head that one is competing with the United States mm -hmm. or competing with England. I think the genesis of inspiration will reside right in the writer's own roots. And, well, that's really it. I think there are plenty of talent, plenty of talent around. I think the writers, the actors will come out from under every rock and stone in the country, providing there is work. In short, it isn't shortage of talent, it's shortage of, of a will to make the talent work and to recognize, and I would also, I would not try to sell these programs for commercial sponsorship. They should be, because uh, I think the most embarrassing possession for a sponsor is the, is the ownership of a drama, because the content of the drama is bound to interfere with his public image. And accepting this as a natural, I don't think these programs should be sold. There should be commercials around it. I believe in commercials in the middle of a program. This has never embarrassed me. In fact, the, the forced break in the middle of a play 
is an exciting uh, structural toehold mm -hmm. that a writer can really use. Mm -hmm. That's a very welcome pause in the middle of a play.